Okay. Hi, Jesse. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you, Douglas? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. I know that you are a dog trainer and you've got a book out called Enlightened Dog Training. And what's the subtitle? Become the peaceful alpha your dog needs and respects. Okay. Now that thing behind you, I've seen that in Kung Fu movies with Bruce Lee. You don't use yeah. that for your dog training, right? No. <laughs> no, of course not. Okay. I was just wondering why it was there. All right. That's for you. That's for your training. Yeah. We're, we're half in my kitchen, half in my office. Well, is that what that is or is it a coat rack? No, no. That, yeah, that's that's a Wing Chun uh, Kung Fu dummy. Wing Chun, right. Okay. And I see a guitar there. You play guitar too? Yeah, yeah. I, I, a little. A little dabble a little bit here and there. But as your job, as your career, you are a dog trainer? Yeah. Okay, how'd you get started doing that? Uh, great question. Um, well, maybe 15 years ago, more or less, I was uh, in the business world. I was working in downtown Toronto and I had a sheepdog puppy. And we sent her to a dog daycare every day while I went to work. And I'd just log on to the webcam and watch her all day long. It was, <laughs> if you're a dog person, you can understand what that's like. Oh, absolutely. Like. Yeah. You know, one day, maybe a year into that job, I showed up and there was a bunch of suits that I didn't recognize. And it turns out that the little software company that I was working for uh, was sold, was purchased by a, a Fortune 500 company. I was out of a job and I didn't want to go. I, I, I liked the idea of being small and lean and entrepreneurial. And I leaned into starting my own business, doing something I loved, but really not knowing a whole lot about it. And I opened up my own dog daycare and grooming salon, and I called it Wolf and Schluff. <laughs> Good name. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, well, actually, I wanted to just open up a dog daycare, but in Toronto at the time, it wasn't even a, a legit business. I had to get around zoning bylaws. So I put a bathtub in the back. And I put grooming, a sticker that said grooming on the window. And then all of a sudden we were zoned OK. And uh, it was a really cool concept. It was a lot of fun. Very quickly, something like 35, 40, 45 different dogs would show up every day for a haircut or for a daycare play or something like that. And very quickly, I learned that dog traditional dog training techniques there's a variety of them, and I studied a lot of them. They, they all have their applications, but none of them really worked on a pack of dogs or multiple dogs at the same time. And I was so keen and so interested in looking after these dogs and just, I got completely absorbed into the idea that they've got calming signals and they've got their own language system. Uh, and I spent a lot of time uh, sort of meditating and, and being with the dogs alone. And one day it just sort of clicked. I just started to see how they were in a constant connection with each other. And when I started mimicking some of their gestures or or the way that they would relate in territory with their bodies or relate in territory to a toy or a resource or something like that. I started to understand that I could be a dog trainer who also communicates to the dogs. And that's sort of when the light bulb went off that I, I might actually be pretty good at this. I've sort of just been following the stream from that moment onward. Uh, I wanted to go back to something you said. You talked about dogs in packs. Is that typically the way dogs are trained? Because it seems to me dogs are trained traditionally one on one, right? One with the trainer and one with the, the dog. Yeah, pack is a funny word. Pack is a funny word because they're not wolves, right? Um, but I think it's just like a way of explaining like, well, if you go to a dog park, Douglas, all of those dogs that are in that park at the same time, 
they're in connection with each other. Sure. Yeah. You know, so something's going on in their consciousness where they're able to relate to each other and they don't really care. And by the way, all of the people who are there too, you know, are they not sort of part of that same group? I don't think at that moment the dogs are kind of going, well, this one's my dad, that one's your dad, this one's my dad, I'm only going to listen to this, I'm not going to listen to that guy, this is your tennis ball, you came in with that one, I'm not, you know, it's yours. They don't really think like that. Although there is a special connection to their master, that's for sure. So give me an example of, of what you would do if somebody comes in, I mean, if somebody comes in with one dog, well, this is a past life, okay? So I sold that business a couple of years ago, but that's where I got my chops, learning how to communicate with dogs and train dogs. And from there, I did a little spin off into private dog training. So just to answer your question, what, what, what would it look like sort of a typical moment in my life back then when I was in the heyday kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the business would open up at 7 a.m. and I would probably get there around 6.30 and I wouldn't bring any staff in for another couple of hours. But dogs would start coming in, Client dog, dog clients would start coming in one by one by one by one. And some would go into the grooming salon, some would go into the daycare room, some would go into the senior room, some would go into the puppy pen and they all have their lunch that would get dropped off and their leashes and you know, those are people things from a dog's perspective. The first dog in, he's pretty calm. Second dog comes in, he's sizing that dog up. He's sizing up that dog's lunch. <laughs> he's uh, he's making his presence known from the the, the inch that the, the, the dog walks through the door. Uh, they were hyper aware. One, you know, once you get three, four, five dogs coming in, getting them calm, getting them quiet was you know, a little bit of a technique that I would do. I would interact with them. I would uh, do training techniques, float obedience training with them, uh, mainly just talking to the dog that's listening the most, but making connections with the dogs who are watching the dog listening. Um, and just taking them through repeatable things. Let's go here, let's stop here, let's go there, let's stop here, let's go over here, let's stop here. And as they start, you know, doing simple repeating things, I want to call them the pack. The pack catches on. And that's something I observe pretty much every animal do in nature. You know, you watch a mother duck and she can tell her quacklings, all right, guys, let's move here now. All right, guys, let's stop here. And when she does that kind of communication, there is, my observation, some interesting feelings that she's creating. It's important. We have to go now. There's urgency. We have to go now. Let's stop now. It's safe. It's safe here to stop here. We have to stay here. You know, think about raccoons kind of moving through the city or something like that. This dog daycare was basically a laboratory for me. I did all kinds of stuff where I was mimicking this body language. And I think at one point I cooked a hot dog and I, I put it in a bowl and I, and I resource guarded it from 45 dogs and wouldn't let any of them touch it until the pack started laying down and putting their chin down. And then I would start to feed the, sort of the calmest ones first and start to use that the rest of that hot dog as sort of a treasure that I could, uh, you know, motivate and inspire dog the, the rest of the dogs to kind of work for me. And, and um, you know, I... I we did this mostly in a meditative state for about 10 years, six days a week, probably 10,000 hours in total, and got really kind of secondhand pretty good at it. So that, you know, in the last few years of the business, I was sort of by myself, mopping up a floor, answering a phone, keeping 30 dogs quiet, rolling into the grooming room, calming down. Uh, have you ever seen... You know, so just looking in a dog grooming room. Have you ever seen taken? Uh, have you ever seen a dog at the vet who doesn't want to get their nails clipped? Yes. They're so scared. Yeah, yeah, mine is that way. You know, what do people? Is that really even training at that point? You know, um, you see, you might see a couple of vet techs sort of holding the dog and, re and refraining the dog, and and I would say benevolently getting the job done. 
But my big thing is, because I'm a mindfulness guy, I want to be able to connect with the dog when they're feeling not safe. And I want to establish building trust and connection and peacefulness so that it's less about dog training and more about, hey, this is safe now. You're OK. And that's where the idea of becoming the peaceful alpha that your dog needs and respects came into play is because while well, all of our dogs love us, but it's not always so easy to tell an anxious dog or a scared dog, hey, you know, you're OK, cut that out and let's go over here or let's do something different. I've noticed sometimes it's the it's not the dog, it's the owners. That's the problem. If they have a dog that doesn't behave well or to their standards or something, a lot of times these people are, can be completely stressed out and they're sending off this terrible energy to the dog. And the dog is picking up on that. I've often noticed that bad dogs have bad owners. Not always, but many times that I've experienced. Those are your that's your language around it. And I completely agree with the with, with what what you're saying. Um, and that's why I wrote the book for humans, because a dog, when he's communicating at the dog park. Has an emotional frequency that's pretty tranquil. It's pretty neutral in general. Actually, this is what I, I sort of describe the vibration of a peaceful alpha. It, it's very calm. And when you can maintain that level of emotion, and then when it's time to act, when it's the right moment to make an action, because in the animal kingdom, you communicate with actions. Actions mean something. Actually, actions create feelings. Um, and we can create feel. This is how the dogs communicate with each other. Have you ever noticed that your dog really doesn't want to stare at your eyes when you're staring at them? They don't really like to like hold eye contact for very long. Similar to like, have you ever noticed how like a kid doesn't want to, you know, stare at a stranger, reach out their hand and shake their hand because direct eye contact in the animal kingdom, if it's held for like a, you know, a second, two seconds, three seconds, it's sending a message that we may have a conflict right now. It's a sign of aggression, it's a, right? Yeah, it's a it's it is a sign. It, it's a it's a sign of aggression. Yeah, sure. And, you know, think about people, too. If somebody's a little bit upset or a little bit angry, they might start pointing and staring at you. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, one of the one of the biggest secrets I ever figured out was just stop looking at your dog. <laughs> <laughs> stop reaching for your dog's face. Every time you do those two things, even if you're just reaching to pet your dog or you're, you're you know, you're soul gazing at your dog, your dog doesn't understand that. Your dog thinks that you're being aggressive and it, it understands that to mean something like, hey, in this very second right now, what is it I'm doing that's, you know, making you upset? So it can be a little bit confusing for the dog taking them at, if that's a, a habit, it can take them out of being naturally calm, naturally just well tempered into a little bit of like a. You think the dog's happy, but the dog's got pent up anxiety or neuroses. It's very rampant. OK, and so uh, the dog language itself, all animals know that eye contact is aggression, so 99% of their body language is just a variety of gestures that are saying, oops, I made eye contact with you, didn't mean it. Right. <laughs> or, or, hey, you're making eye contact with me, but don't worry, you can trust me. These are called calming signals. And I think that getting sort of circling right back, I totally think our dog is our guru because I think that our dog all of our dogs, are you good with Yiddish? All of our dogs, Misha Gus is, is our own shtick. <laughs> it's our own neuroses show up in our dog's 
behavior quirks. I absolutely agree with you on that. And I think I've learned more from them than they've learned from me because they seem to, they have, they got my routine down before I even knew I had a routine. And Very when astute I, of you. <laughs> and, and when I see that mirrored back at me, I'd laughed. I thought it was incredibly funny. Um, we, exactly. do have to, we do have to wrap yeah. this up, Jesse. We've kind of run over, unfortunately. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Yeah, um, peacefulalpha.com. Okay, and people can find your book there and learn sure, more about people you. Can yeah. Find, yeah, people can find my book there, where to get it. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experience with the dogs. Most enlightening. And uh...